Chapter Twelve of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Imp of the Perverse. In the consideration of the faculties and impulses of the prima mobilia of the human soul the phrenologists have failed to make room for a propensity which although obviously existing as a radical primitive irreducible sentiment has been equally overlooked by all the moralists who have preceded them in the pure arrogance of the reason we have all overlooked it we have suffered its existence to escape our senses solely through want of belief of faith whether it be faith in revelation or faith in the kabbalah the idea of it has never occurred to us simply because of its supererogation we saw no need of the impulse for the propensity we could not perceive its necessity we could not understand that is to say we could not have understood had the notion of this primum mobile ever obtruded itself we could not have understood in what manner it might be made to further the objects of humanity either temporal or eternal it cannot be denied that phrenology and in a great measure all metaphysicianism have been concocted a priori the intellectual or logical man rather than the understanding or observant man set himself to imagine designs to dictate purposes to god having thus fathomed to his satisfaction the intentions of jehovah out of these intentions he built his innumerable systems of mind in the matter of phrenology for example we first determined naturally enough that it was the design of the deity that man should eat we then assigned to man an organ of alimentiveness and this organ is the scourge with which the deity compels man will i nil i into eating secondly having settled it to be god's will that man should continue his species we discovered an organ of amativeness forthwith and so with combativeness with ideality with causality with constructiveness so in short with every organ whether representing a propensity a moral sentiment or a faculty of the pure intellect and in these arrangements of the principia of human action the spasimites whether right or wrong in part or upon the whole have but followed in principle the footsteps of their predecessors deducing and establishing everything from the preconceived destiny of man and upon the ground of the objects of his creator it would have been wiser it would have been safer to classify if classify we must upon the basis of what man usually or occasionally did and was always occasionally doing rather than upon the basis of what we took it for granted that deity intended him to do if we cannot comprehend god in his visible works how then in his inconceivable thoughts that call the works into being if we cannot understand him in his objective creatures how then in his substantive moods and phases of creation induction a posteriori would have brought phrenology to admit as an innate and primitive principle of human action a paradoxical something which we may call perverseness for want of a more characteristic term in the sense i intend it is in fact a mobili without motive a motive not motivert through its promptings we act without comprehensible object or if this shall be understood as a contradiction in terms we may so far modify the proposition as to say 
that through its promptings we act for the reason that we should not in theory no reason can be more unreasonable but in fact there is none more strong with certain minds under certain conditions it becomes absolutely irresistible i am not more certain that i breathe than that the assurance of the wrong or error of any action is often the one unconquerable force which impels us and alone impels us to its prosecution nor will this overwhelming tendency to do wrong for the wrong's sake admit of analysis or resolution into ulterior element it is a radical a primitive impulse elementary it will be said i am aware that when we persist in acts because we feel we should not persist in them our conduct is but a modification of that which ordinarily springs from the combativeness of phrenology but a glance will show the fallacy of this idea the phrenological combativeness has for its essence the necessity of self-defence it is our safeguard against injury its principle regards our well-being and thus the desire to be well is excited simultaneously with its development it follows that the desire to be well must be excited simultaneously with any principle which shall be merely a modification of combativeness but in the case of that something which i term perverseness the desire to be well is not only not aroused but a strongly antagonistical sentiment exists an appeal to one's own heart is after all the best reply to the sophistry just noticed no one who trustingly consults and thoroughly questions his own soul will be disposed to deny the entire radicalness of the propensity in question it is not more incomprehensible than distinctive there lives no man who at some period has not been tormented for example by an earnest desire to tantalize a listener by circumlocution the speaker is aware that he displeases he has every intention to please he is usually curt precise and clear the most laconic and luminous language is struggling for utterance upon his tongue it is only with difficulty that he restrains himself from giving it flow he dreads and deprecates the anger of him whom he addresses yet the thought strikes him that by certain involutions and parentheses this anger may be engendered that single thought is enough the impulse increases to a wish the wish to a desire the desire to an uncontrollable longing and the longing to the deep regret and mortification of the speaker and in defiance of all consequences is indulged we have a task before us which must be speedily performed we know that it will be ruinous to make delay the most important crisis of our life calls trumpet tongued for immediate energy and action we glow we are consumed with eagerness to commence the work with the anticipation of whose glorious result our whole souls are on fire it must it shall be undertaken to-day and yet we put it off until to-morrow and why there is no answer except that we feel perverse using the word with no comprehension of the principle to-morrow arrives and with it a more impatient anxiety to do our duty but with this very increase of anxiety arrives also a nameless a positively fearful because unfathomable craving for delay this craving gathers strength as the moments fly the last hour for action is at hand we tremble with the violence of the conflict within us of the definite with the indefinite of the substance with the shadow but if the contest have proceeded thus far it is the shadow which prevails we struggle in vain the clock strikes and is the knell of our welfare at the same time it is the chanticleer note to the ghost that has so long over us it flies it disappears we are free the old energy returns we will labour now alas it is too late 
we stand upon the brink of a precipice we peer into the abyss we grow sick and dizzy our first impulse is to shrink from the danger unaccountably we remain by slow degrees our sickness and dizziness and horror become merged in a cloud of unnameable feeling by gradations still more imperceptible this cloud assumes shape as did the vapour from the bottle out of which arose the genius in the arabian nights but out of this our cloud upon the precipice's edge there grows into palpability a shape far more terrible than any genius or any demon of a tale and yet it is but a thought although a fearful one and one which chills the very marrow of our bones with the fierceness of the delight of its horror it is merely the idea of what would be our sensations during the sweeping precipitancy of a fall from such a height and this fall this rushing annihilation for the very reason that it involves that one most ghastly and loathsome of all the most ghastly and loathsome images of death and suffering which have ever presented themselves to our imagination for this very cause do we now the most vividly desire it and because our reason violently deters us from the brink therefore do we the most impetuously approach it there is no passion in nature so demoniacally impatient as that of him who shuddering upon the edge of a precipice thus meditates a plunge to indulge for a moment in any attempt at thought is to be inevitably lost for reflection but urges us to forbear and therefore it is i say that we cannot if there be no friendly arm to check us or if we fail in a sudden effort to prostrate ourselves backward from the abyss we plunge and are destroyed examine these similar actions as we will we shall find them resulting solely from the spirit of the perverse we perpetrate them because we feel that we should not beyond or behind this there is no intelligible principle and we might indeed deem this perverseness a direct instigation of the arch-fiend were it not occasionally known to operate in furtherance of good i have said thus much that in some measure i may answer your question that i may explain to you why i am here that i may assign to you something that shall have at least the faint aspect of a cause for my wearing these fetters and for my tenanting this cell of the condemned had i not been thus prolix you might either have misunderstood me altogether or with the rabble have fancied me mad as it is you will easily perceive that i am one of the many uncounted victims of the imp of the perverse it is impossible that any deed could have been wrought with a more thorough deliberation for weeks for months i pondered upon the means of the murder i rejected a thousand schemes because their accomplishment involved the chance of detection at length in reading some french memoirs i found an account of a nearly fatal illness that occurred to madame pilau through the agency of a candle accidentally poisoned the idea struck my fancy at once i knew my victim's habit of reading in bed i knew too that his apartment was narrow and ill-ventilated but i need not vex you with impertinent details i need not describe the easy artifices by which i substituted in his bedroom candle-stand a wax-light of my own making for the one which i there found the next morning he was discovered dead in his bed and the coroner's verdict was death by the visitation of god having inherited his estate all went well with me for years the idea of detection never once entered my brain of the remains of the fatal taper i had myself carefully disposed i had left no shadow of a clue by which it would be possible to convict or even to suspect me of the crime 
it is inconceivable how rich a sentiment of satisfaction arose in my bosom as i reflected upon my absolute security for a very long period of time i was accustomed to revel in this sentiment it afforded me more real delight than all the mere worldly advantages accruing from my sin but there arrived at length an epoch from which the pleasurable feeling grew by scarcely perceptible gradations into a haunting and harassing thought it harassed because it haunted i could scarcely get rid of it for an instant it is quite a common thing to be thus annoyed with the ringing in our ears or rather in our memories of the burthen of some ordinary song or some unimpressive snatches from an opera nor will we be the less tormented if the song in itself be good or the opera air meritorious in this manner at last i would perpetually catch myself pondering upon my security and repeating in a low undertone the phrase i am safe one day while sauntering along the streets i arrested myself in the act of murmuring half aloud these customary syllables in a fit of petulance i remodelled them thus i am safe i am safe yes if i be not fool enough to make open confession no sooner had i spoken these words than i felt an icy chill creep to my heart i had had some experience in these fits of perversity whose nature i have been at some trouble to explain and i remembered well that in no instance i had successfully resisted their attacks and now my own casual self-suggestion that i might possibly be fool enough to confess the murder of which i had been guilty confronted me as if the very ghost of him whom i had murdered had beckoned me on to death at first i made an effort to shake off this nightmare of the soul i walked vigorously faster still faster at length i ran i felt a maddening desire to shriek aloud every succeeding wave of thought overwhelmed me with new terror for alas i well too well understood that to think in my situation was to be lost i still quickened my pace i bounded like a madman through the crowded thoroughfares at length the populace took the alarm and pursued me i felt then the consummation of my fate could i have torn out my tongue i would have done it but a rough voice resounded in my ears a rougher grasp seized me by the shoulder i turned i gasped for breath for a moment i experienced all the pangs of suffocation i became blind and deaf and giddy and then some invisible fiend i thought struck me with his broad palm upon the back the long imprisoned secret burst forth from my soul they say that i spoke with a distinct enunciation but with marked emphasis and passionate hurry as if in dread of interruption before concluding the brief but pregnant sentences that consigned me to the hangman and to hell having related all that was necessary for the fullest judicial conviction i fell prostrate in a swoon but why shall i say more to-day i wear these chains and am here to-morrow i shall be fetterless but where end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Island of the Fay. Nullus enim locus, sine genio est. Servius. La musique, says Mamantel, in those contes Moreau. Moreau is here derived from Murs, 
and its meaning is fashionable or more strictly of manners which in all our translations we have insisted upon calling moral tales as if in mockery of their spirit la musique est le seul des talents qui jouissent de lui-même tous les autres volant des témoins he here confounds the pleasure derivable from sweet sounds with the capacity for creating them no more than any other talent is that for music susceptible of complete enjoyment where there is no second party to appreciate its exercise and it is only in common with other talents that it produces effects which may be fully enjoyed in solitude the idea which the raconteur has either failed to entertain clearly or has sacrificed in its expression to his national love of point is doubtless the very tenable one that the higher order of music is the most thoroughly estimated when we are exclusively alone the proposition in this form will be admitted at once by those who love the lyre for its own sake and for its spiritual uses but there is one pleasure still within the reach of fallen mortality and perhaps only one which owes even more than does music to the accessory sentiment of seclusion i mean the happiness experienced in the contemplation of natural scenery in truth the man who would behold aright the glory of god upon earth must in solitude behold that glory to me at least the presence not of human life only but of life in any other form than that of the green things which grow upon the soil and are voiceless is a stain upon the landscape is at war with the genius of the scene i love indeed to regard the dark valleys and the grey rocks and the waters that silently smile and the forests that sigh in uneasy slumbers and the proud watchful mountains that look down upon all i love to regard these as themselves but the colossal members of one vast animate and sentient whole a whole whose form that of the sphere is the most perfect and most inclusive of all whose path is among associate planets whose meek handmaiden is the moon whose mediate sovereign is the sun whose life is eternity whose thought is that of a god whose enjoyment is knowledge whose destinies are lost in immensity whose cognizance of ourselves is akin with our own cognizance of the animalculi which infest the brain a being which we in consequence regard as purely inanimate and material much in the same manner as these animalculi must thus regard us our telescopes and our mathematical investigations assure us on every hand notwithstanding the cant of the most ignorant of the priesthood that space and therefore that bulk is an important consideration in the eyes of the almighty the cycles in which the stars move are those best adapted for the evolution without collision of the greatest possible number of bodies the forms of those bodies are accurately such as within a given surface to include the greatest possible amount of matter while the surfaces themselves are so disposed as to accommodate a denser population than could be accommodated on the same surfaces otherwise arranged nor is it any argument against bulk being an object with god that space itself is infinite 
for there may be an infinity of matter to fill it. And since we see clearly that the endowment of matter with vitality is a principle, indeed, as far as our judgments extend, the leading principle in the operations of deity, it is scarcely logical to imagine it confined to the regions of the minute, where we daily trace it, and not extending to those of the august. As we find cycle within cycle, without end, yet all revolving around one far distant centre, which is the Godhead, may we not analogically suppose in the same manner life within life, the less within the greater, and all within the spirit divine. In short, we are madly erring through self-esteem in believing man in either his temporal or future destinies to be of more moment in the universe than that vast clod of the valley which he tills and condemns and to which he denies a soul for no more profound reason than that he does not behold it in operation speaking of the tides a pomponius mailer in his treatise de situ orbis says either the world is a great animal or etc these fancies and such as these have always given to my meditations among the mountains and the forests by the rivers and the ocean a tinge of what the everyday world would not fail to term fantastic my wanderings amid such scenes have been many and far-searching and often solitary and the interest with which i have strayed through many a dim deep valley or gazed into the reflected heaven of many a bright lake has been an interest greatly deepened by the thought that i have strayed and gazed alone what flippant frenchman was it who said in allusion to the well-known work of zimmermann that la solitude est une belle chose mais il faut quelqu'un pour vous dire que la solitude est une belle chose the epigram cannot be gainsaid but the necessity is a thing that does not exist it was during one of my lonely journeyings amid a far distant region of mountain locked within mountain and sad rivers and melancholy tarn writhing or sleeping within all that i chanced upon a certain rivulet and island i came upon them suddenly in the leafy june and threw myself upon the turf beneath the branches of an unknown odorous shrub that I might doze as I contemplated the scene. I felt that thus only should I look upon it. Such was the character of phantasm which it wore. On all sides, save to the west, where the sun was about sinking, arose the verdant walls of the forest. The little river which turned sharply in its course, and was thus immediately lost to sight, seemed to have no exit from its prison but to be absorbed by the deep green foliage of the trees to the east while in the opposite quarter so it appeared to me as i lay at length and glanced upwards there poured down noiselessly and continuously into the valley a rich golden and crimson waterfall from the sunset fountains of the sky about midway in the short vista which my dreamy vision took in one small circular island profusely verged reposed upon the bosom of the stream so blended bank and shadow there that each seemed pendulous in air so mirror-like was the glassy water that it was scarcely possible to say at what point upon the slope of the emerald turf its crystal dominion began my position enabled me to include in a single view both the eastern and western extremities of the islet 
and I observed a singularly marked difference in their aspects. The latter was all one radiant harem of garden beauties. It glowed and blushed beneath the eyes of the slant sunlight, and fairly laughed with flowers. The grass was short, springy, sweet-scented, and asphodel interspersed. The trees were lithe, mirthful, erect, bright, slender, and graceful, of eastern figure and foliage, with bark smooth, glossy, and parti-coloured. There seemed a deep sense of life and joy about all, and although no airs blew from out the heavens, yet everything had motion through the gentle sweepings to and fro of innumerable butterflies that might have been mistaken for tulips with wings. Florem putares nare paliquidum aethera, p. Comere. The other, or eastern end of the isle, was whelmed in the blackest shade. A sombre yet beautiful and peaceful gloom here pervaded all things. The trees were dark in colour and mournful in form and attitude, wreathing themselves into sad, solemn and spectral shapes that conveyed ideas of mortal sorrow and untimely death. The grass wore the deep tint of the cypress, and the heads of its blades hung droopingly, and hither and thither among it were many small unsightly hillocks, low and narrow and not very long, that had the aspect of graves, but were not although over and all about them the rue and the rosemary clambered. The shade of the trees fell heavily upon the water and seemed to bury itself therein, impregnating the depths of the elements with darkness. I fancied that each shadow, as the sun descended lower and lower, separated itself sullenly from the trunk that gave it birth, and thus became absorbed by the stream, while other shadows issued momently from the trees, taking the place of their predecessors, thus entombed. This idea, having once seized upon my fancy, greatly excited it, and I lost myself forthwith in reverie. If ever island were enchanted, said I to myself, this is it, this is the haunt of the few gentle fays who remain from the wreck of the race. Are these green tombs theirs, or do they yield up their sweet lives, as mankind yield up their own? In dying, do they not rather waste away mournfully, rendering unto God little by little their existence, as these trees render up shadow after shadow, exhausting their substance unto dissolution. What the wasting tree is to the water that imbibes its shade, growing thus blacker by what it preys upon, may not the life of the fay be to the death which engulfs it. As I thus mused, with half-shut eyes, while the sun sank rapidly to rest, and eddying currents careered round and round the island, bearing upon their bosom large dazzling white flakes of the bark of the sycamore, flakes which, in their multiform positions upon the water, a quick imagination might have converted into anything it pleased. While I thus mused, it appeared to me that the form of one of those very fays about whom I had been pondering made its way slowly into the darkness from out the light at the western end of the island. She stood erect 
in a singularly fragile canoe, and urged it with the mere phantom of an oar, while within the influence of the lingering sunbeams her attitude seemed indicative of joy. But sorrow deformed it as she passed within the shade. Slowly she glided along, and at length rounded the islet, and re-entered the region of light. The revolution which has just been made by the Fay, continued I musingly, is the cycle of the brief year of her life. She has floated through her winter and through her summer. She is a year nearer unto death, for I did not fail to see that, as she came into the shade, her shadow fell from her, and was swallowed up in the dark water, making its blackness more black. And again the boat appeared, and the fay, but about the attitude of the latter there was more of care and uncertainty, and less of elastic joy. She floated again from out the light and into the gloom, which deepened momently, and again her shadow fell from her into the ebony water, and became absorbed into its blackness. And again and again she made the circuit of the island, while the sun rushed down to his slumbers, and at each issuing into the light there was more sorrow about her person, while it grew feebler and far fainter and more indistinct and at each passage into the gloom there fell from her a darker shade, which became whelmed in a shadow more black. But at length, when the sun had utterly departed, the fay, now the mere ghost of her former self, went disconsolately with her boat into the region of the ebony flood, and that she issued thence at all I cannot say, for darkness fell over all things, and I beheld her magical figure no more. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 2 By Edgar Allan Poe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Assignation. Stay for me there. I will not fail to meet thee in that hollow vale. Exequy on the death of his wife, by Henry King, Bishop of Chichester. Ill-fated and mysterious man bewildered in the brilliancy of thine own imagination and fallen in the flames of thine own youth again in fancy i behold thee once more thy form hath risen before me not oh not as thou art in the cold valley and shadow but as thou shouldst be squandering away a life of magnificent meditation in that city of dim visions thine own venice which is a star beloved elysium of the sea and the wide windows of whose palladian palaces look down with a deep and bitter meaning upon the secrets of her silent waters yes i repeat it as thou shouldst be there are surely other worlds than this other thoughts than the thoughts of the multitude other speculations than the speculations of the sophist who then shall call thy conduct into question who blame thee for thy visionary hours or denounce those occupations as a wasting away of life which were but the overflowings of thine everlasting energies it was at venice beneath the covered archway there called the ponte di sospiri that i met for the third or fourth time the person of whom i speak it is with a confused recollection that i bring to mind 
the circumstances of that meeting yet i remember ah how should i forget the deep midnight the bridge of sighs the beauty of woman and the genius of romance that stalked up and down the narrow canal the great clock of the piazza had sounded the fifth hour of the italian evening the square of the campanile lay silent and deserted and the lights in the old ducal palace were dying fast away i was returning home from the piazzetta by way of the grand canal but as my gondola arrived opposite the mouth of the canal san marco a female voice from its recesses broke suddenly upon the night in one wild hysterical and long continued shriek startled at the sound i sprang upon my feet while the gondolier letting slip his single oar lost it in the pitchy darkness beyond the chance of recovery and we were consequently left to the guidance of the current which here sets from the greater into the smaller channel like some huge and sable feathered condor we were slowly drifting down towards the bridge of sighs when a thousand flambeaux flashing from the windows and down the staircases of the ducal palace turned all at once that deep gloom into a livid and preternatural day a child slipping from the arms of its own mother had fallen from an upper window of the lofty structure into the deep and dim canal the quiet waters had closed placidly over their victim and although my own gondola was the only one in sight many a stout swimmer already in the stream was seeking in vain upon the surface the treasure which was to be found alas only within the abyss upon the broad black marble flagstones at the entrance of the palace and a few steps above the water stood a figure which none who then saw can have ever since forgotten it was the marchesa aphrodite the adoration of all venice the gayest of the gay the most lovely where all were beautiful but still the young wife of the old and intriguing mentoni and the mother of that fair child her first and only one who now deep beneath the murky water was thinking in bitterness of heart upon her sweet caresses and exhausting its little life in struggles to call upon her name she stood alone her small bare and silvery feet gleamed in the black mirror of marble beneath her her hair not as yet more than half loosened for the night from its ballroom array clustered amid a shower of diamonds round and round her classical head in curls like those of the young hyacinth a snowy white and gauze-like drapery seemed to be nearly the sole covering to her delicate form but the midsummer and midnight air was hot sullen and still and no motion in the statue-like form itself stirred even the folds of that raiment of very vapour which hung around it as the heavy marble hangs around the niobe yet strange to say her large lustrous eyes were not turned downwards upon that grave wherein her brightest hope lay buried but riveted in a widely different direction the prison of the old republic is i think the stateliest building in all venice but how could that lady gaze so fixedly upon it when beneath her lay stifling her only child yon dark gloomy niche too yawns right opposite her chamber window what then could there be in its shadows in its architecture in its ivy wreathed and solemn cornices that the marchese di mentoni have not wondered at a thousand times before nonsense who does not remember that at such a time as this 
the eye, like a shattered mirror, multiplies the images of its sorrow, and sees in innumerable far-off places the woe which is close at hand. Many steps above the Marquesa, and within the arch of the water-gate stood, in full dress, the satyr-like figure of Mentoni himself. He was occasionally occupied in thrumming a guitar, and seemed on the way to the very death, as at intervals he gave directions for the recovery of his child. Stupefied and aghast, I have myself no power to move from the upright position I had assumed upon first hearing the shriek and must have presented to the eyes of the agitated group a spectral and ominous appearance, as with pale countenance and rigid limbs I floated down among them in that funereal gondola. All efforts proved in vain. Many of the most energetic in the search were relaxing their exertions and yielding to a gloomy sorrow there seemed but little hope for the child how much less then for the mother but now from the interior of that dark niche which has been already mentioned as forming a part of the old republican prison and as fronting the lattice of the marchesa a figure muffled in a cloak stepped out within reach of the light and pausing a moment upon the verge of the giddy descent plunged headlong into the canal as in an instant afterward he stood with the still living and breathing child within his grasp upon the marble flagstones by the side of the marchesa his cloak heavy with the drenching water became unfastened and falling in folds about his feet discovered to the wonder-stricken spectators the graceful person of a very young man with the sound of whose name the greater part of Europe was then ringing. No word spoke the deliverer, but the Marchesa. She will now receive her child, she will press it to her heart, she will cling to its little form and smother it with her caresses. Alas, another's arms have taken it from the stranger, another's arms have taken it away and borne it afar off, unnoticed into the palace and the marchesa her lip her beautiful lip trembles tears are gathering in her eyes those eyes which like pliny's acanthus are soft and almost liquid yes tears are gathering in those eyes and see the entire woman thrills throughout the soul and the statue has started into life the pallor of the marble countenance the swelling of the marble bosom, the very purity of the marble feet, we behold suddenly flushed over with a tide of ungovernable crimson, and a slight shudder quivers about her delicate frame, as a gentle air at Napoli about the rich silver lilies in the grass. Why should that lady blush? To this demand there is no answer, except that having left in the eager haste and terror of a mother's heart the privacy of her own boudoir she has neglected to enthrall her tiny feet in their slippers and utterly forgotten to throw over her venetian shoulders that drapery which is their due what other possible reason could there have been for her so blushing for the glance of those wild appealing eyes for the unusual tumult of that throbbing bosom, for the convulsive pressure of that trembling hand, that hand which fell as Mentoni turned into the palace, accidentally upon the hand of the stranger. What reason could there have been for the low, the singularly low tone of those unmeaning words which the lady uttered hurriedly in bidding him adieu? Thou hast conquered, she said, for the murmurs of the water deceive me. Thou hast conquered one hour after sunrise we shall meet. So let it be. The tumult had subsided. The lights had died away within the palace. 
and the stranger whom i now recognized stood alone upon the flag he shook with inconceivable agitation and his eye glanced around in search of a gondola i could not do less than offer him the service of my own and he accepted the civility having obtained an oar at the water gate we proceeded together to his residence while he rapidly recovered his self-possession and spoke of our former slight acquaintance in terms of great apparent cordiality there are some subjects upon which i take pleasure in being minute the person of the stranger let me call him by this title who to all the world was still a stranger the person of the stranger is one of these subjects in height he might have been below rather than above the medium size although there were moments of intense passion when his frame actually expanded and belied the assertion the light almost slender symmetry of his figure promised more of that ready activity which he evinced at the bridge of size than of that herculean strength which he has been known to wield without an effort upon occasions of more dangerous emergency with the mouth and chin of a deity singular wild full liquid eyes whose shadows varied from pure hazel to intense and brilliant jet and a profusion of curling black hair from which a forehead of unusual breadth gleamed forth at intervals all light and ivory his were features than which i have seen none more classically regular except perhaps the marble ones of the emperor commodius yet his countenance was nevertheless one of those which all men have seen at some period of their lives and have never afterwards seen again it had no peculiar it had no subtle predominant expression to be fastened upon the memory a countenance seen and instantly forgotten but forgotten with a vague and never-ceasing desire of recalling it to mind not that the spirit of each rapid passion failed at any time to throw its own distinct image upon the mirror of that face but that the mirror mirror-like retained no vestige of the passion when the passion had departed upon leaving him on the night of our adventure he solicited me in what i thought an urgent manner to call upon him very early the next morning shortly after sunrise i found myself accordingly at his palazzo one of those huge structures of gloomy yet fantastic pomp which tower above the waters of the grand canal in the vicinity of the rialto i was shown up a broad winding staircase of mosaic into an apartment whose unparalleled splendour burst through the opening door with an actual glare making me blind and dizzy with luxuriousness i knew my acquaintance to be wealthy report had spoken of his possessions in terms which i had even ventured to call terms of ridiculous exaggeration but as i gazed about me i could not bring myself to believe that the wealth of any subject in europe could have supplied the princely magnificence which burned and blazed around although as i say the sun had arisen yet the room was still brilliantly lighted up i judged from this circumstance as well as from an air of exhaustion in the countenance of my friend that he had not retired to bed during the whole of the preceding night in the architecture and embellishments of the chamber the evident design had been to dazzle and astound little attention had been paid to the decora 
of what is technically called keeping or to the proprietors of nationality the eye wandered from object to object and rested upon none neither the grotesques of the greek painters nor the sculptures of the best italian days nor the huge carvings of untutored egypt rich draperies in every part of the room trembled to the vibration of low melancholy music whose origin was not to be discovered the senses were oppressed by mingled and conflicting perfumes reeking up from strange convolute senses together with multitudinous flaring and flickering tongues of emerald and violet fire the rays of the newly risen sun poured in upon the hall through windows formed each of a single pane of crimson tinted glass glancing to and fro in a thousand reflections from curtains which rolled from their cornices like cataracts of molten silver the beams of natural glory mingled at length fitfully with the artificial light and lay weltering in subdued masses upon a carpet of rich liquid-looking cloth of chilly gold <laughs> laughed the proprietor motioning me to a seat as i entered the room and throwing himself back at full length upon an ottoman i see said he perceiving that i could not immediately reconcile myself to the bien seance of so singular a welcome i see you are astonished at my apartment at my statues my pictures my originality of conception in architecture and upholstery absolutely drunk eh with my magnificence but pardon me my dear sir here his tone of voice dropped to the very spirit of cordiality pardon me for my uncharitable laughter you appeared so utterly astonished besides some things are so completely ludicrous that a man must laugh or die to die laughing must be the most glorious of all glorious deaths sir thomas more a very fine man was sir thomas more sir thomas more died laughing you remember also in the absurdities of aravisius textor there is a long list of characters who came to the same magnificent end do you know however continued he musingly that at sparta which is now palai okori at sparta i say to the west of the citadel among a chaos of scarcely visible ruins is a kind of circle upon which are still legible the letters i am they are undoubtedly part of pay ar ema now at sparta were a thousand temples and shrines to a thousand different divinities how exceedingly strange that the altar of laughter should have survived all the others but in the present instance he resumed with a singular alteration of voice and manner i have no right to be merry at your expense you might well have been amazed europe cannot produce anything so fine as this my little regal cabinet my other apartments are by no means of the same order mere ultras of fashionable insipidity this is better than fashion is it not yet this has but to be seen to become the rage that is with those who could afford it at the cost of their entire patrimony i have guarded however against any such profanation with one exception you are the only human being besides myself and my valet who has been admitted within the mysteries of these imperial precincts since they have been bedizened as you see i bowed in acknowledgment for the overpowering sense of splendour and perfume and music together with the unexpected eccentricity of his address and manner prevented me from expressing in words my appreciation 
of what I might have construed into a compliment. Here, he resumed, arising and leaning on my arm, as he sauntered around the apartment, here are paintings from the Greeks to Kimabue, and from Kimabue to the present hour. Many are chosen, as you see, with little deference to the opinions of Vertu. They are all, however, a fitting tapestry for a chamber such as this. Here, too, are some chef d'oeuvre of the unknown great, and here, unfinished designs by men, celebrated in their day, whose very names the perspicacity of the academies has left to silence and to me. What think you? said he, turning abruptly as he spoke. What think you of this Madonna della Pieta? It is Guido's own, I said, with all the enthusiasm of my nature, for I have been poring intently over its surpassing loveliness. It is Guido's own. How could you have obtained it? She is undoubtedly in painting what the Venus is in sculpture. Ha! <laughs> said he thoughtfully the venus the beautiful venus the venus of the medici she of the diminutive head and the gilded hair part of the left arm here his voice dropped so as to be heard with difficulty and all the right are restorations and in the coquetry of that right arm lies i think the quintessence of all affectation Oh, give me the canova the apollo too is a copy there can be no doubt of it blind fool that i am who cannot behold the boasted inspiration of the apollo i cannot help pity me i cannot help preferring the antinous was it not socrates who said that the statuary found his statue in the block of marble then michael angelo was by no means original in his couplet non ha latimo artista alcun concetto che un marmo sola in se non circumscriva it has been or should be remarked that in the manner of the true gentleman we are always aware of a difference from the bearing of the vulgar without being at once precisely able to determine in what such difference consists allowing the remark to have applied in its full force to the outward demeanour of my acquaintance i felt it on that eventful morning still more fully applicable to his moral temperament and character nor can i better define that peculiarity of spirit which seemed to place him so essentially apart from all other human beings than by calling it a habit of intense and continual thought, pervading even his most trivial actions, intruding upon his moments of dalliance, and interweaving itself with his very flashes of merriment, like adders which writhe from out the eyes of the grinning masks in the cornices around the temples of Persepolis. I could not help, however, repeatedly observing through the mingled tone of levity and solemnity with which he rapidly descanted upon matters of little importance a certain air of trepidation a degree of nervous unction in action and in speech an unquiet excitability of manner which appeared to me at all times unaccountable and upon some occasions even filled me with alarm frequently too pausing in the middle of a sentence whose commencement he had apparently forgotten he seemed to be listening in the deepest attention as if either in momentary expectation of a visitor or to sounds which must have had existence in his imagination alone it was during one of these reveries or pauses of apparent abstraction that in turning over a page of the poet and scholar Politian's beautiful tragedy the orfeo the first native italian tragedy which lay near me upon an ottoman 
I discovered a passage underlined in pencil. It was a passage towards the end of the third act, a passage of the most heart-stirring excitement, a passage which, although tainted with impurity, no man shall read without a thrill of novel emotion, no woman without a sigh. The whole page was blotted with fresh tears, and upon the opposite interleaf were the following English lines, written in a hand so very different from the peculiar characters of my acquaintance, that I had some difficulty in recognising it as his own. Thou wast that all to me, love, for which my soul did pine, a green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine, all wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Ah, dream, too bright to last, ah, starry hope, that didst arise but to be overcast, a voice from out the future cries, onward, but o'er the past dim gulf, my spirit hovering lies, mute, motionless, aghast, for alas, alas, with me, the light of life is o'er, no more, no more, no more. Such language holds the solemn sea to the sands upon the shore. Shall bloom the thunder-blasted tree or the stricken eagle soar? Now all my hours are trances and all my nightly dreams are where the dark eye glances and where thy footstep gleams. In what ethereal dances, by what italian streams alas for that accursed time they bore the other billow from love to titled age and crime and an unholy pillow from me and from our misty clime where weeps the silver willow that these lines were written in english a language with which i had not believed their author acquainted afforded no little matter for surprise. I was too well aware of the extent of his acquirements, and of the singular pleasure he took in concealing them from observation, to be astonished at any similar discovery. But the place of date, I must confess, occasioned me no little amazement. It had been originally written London, and afterwards carefully overscored not however so effectually as to conceal the word from a scrutinizing eye i say this occasioned me no little amazement for i well remember that in a former conversation with a friend i particularly inquired if he had at any time met in london the marchesa di mentoni who for some years previous to her marriage had resided in that city when his answer, if I mistake not, gave me to understand that he had never visited the metropolis of Great Britain. I might as well here mention that I have more than once heard, without, of course, giving credit to a report involving so many improbabilities, that the person of whom I speak was not only by birth, but in education, an Englishman. There is one painting, said he, without being aware of my notice of the tragedy. There is still one painting which you have not seen. And throwing aside a drapery, he discovered a full-length portrait of the Marchesa Aphrodite. Human art could have done no more in the delineation of her superhuman beauty. The same ethereal figure which stood before me the preceding night upon the steps of the ducal palace stood before me once again but in the expression of the countenance which was beaming all over with smiles there still lurked incomprehensible anomaly that fitful stain of melancholy which will ever be found inseparable from the perfection of the beautiful her right arm lay folded over her bosom with her left she pointed downward 
to a curiously fashioned vase one small fairy foot alone visible barely touched the earth and scarcely discernible in the brilliant atmosphere which seemed to encircle and enshrine her loveliness floated a pair of the most delicately imagined wings my glance fell from the painting to the figure of my friend and the vigorous words of chapman's boussy d'amboire quivered instinctively upon my lips he is up there like a roman statue he will stand till death hath made him marble come he said at length turning towards a table of richly enamelled and massive silver upon which were a few goblets fantastically stained together with two large etruscan vases fashioned in the same extraordinary model as that in the foreground of the portrait and filled with what i suppose to be johannisberger come he said abruptly let us drink it is early but let us drink it is indeed early he continued musingly as a cherub with a heavy golden hammer made the apartment ring with the first hour after sunrise it is indeed early but what matters it let us drink let us pour out an offering to yon solemn sun which these gaudy lamps and censers are so eager to subdue and having made me pledge him in a bumper he swallowed in rapid succession several goblets of the wine to dream he continued resuming the tone of his desultory conversation as he held up to the rich light of a censer one of the magnificent vases to dream had been the business of my life i have therefore framed for myself as you see a bower of dreams in the heart of venice could i have erected a better you behold around you it is true a medley of architectural embellishments the chastity of ionia is offended by antediluvian devices and the sphinxes of egypt are outstretched upon carpets of gold yet the effect is incongruous to the timid alone proprietors of place and especially of time are the bugbears which terrify mankind from the contemplation of the magnificent once i was myself a decorous but that sublimation of folly has palled upon my soul all this is now the fitter for my purpose like these arabesque censers my spirit is writhing in fire and the delirium of this scene is fashioning me for the wilder visions of that land of real dreams whither i am now rapidly departing he here paused abruptly bent his head to his bosom and seemed to listen to a sound which i could not hear at length erecting his frame he looked upwards and ejaculated the lines of the bishop of chichester stay for me there i will not fail to meet thee in that hollow vale in the next instant confessing the power of the wine he threw himself at full length upon an ottoman a quick step was now heard upon the staircase and a loud knock at the door rapidly succeeded i was hastening to anticipate a second disturbance when a page of mentoni's household burst into the room and faltered out in a voice choking with emotion the incoherent words my mistress my mistress poisoned poison oh beautiful oh beautiful aphrodite <laughs> bewildered i flew to the ottoman and endeavoured to arouse the sleeper to a sense of the startling intelligence but his limbs were rigid his lips were livid his lately beaming eyes were riveted in death i staggered back towards the table my hand fell upon a cracked and blackened goblet and a consciousness of the entire and terrible truth flashed suddenly over my soul End of chapter fourteen